Once again, welcome friends and family to the Gathering the Fragments series. Today's subject is entitled, The Final Call and the Final Generation. The Final Call and the Final Generation. Beloved, in this day and age, in this final generation, God has a plan that will cut the work short and it will do so in righteousness. Inspiration tells us that success in any line demands a definite aim. If we're seeking the success of Jesus in this generation, if we're seeking the success of our faithful high priest in our generation, beloved, the question is, do we know what God's aim is at this time? Are we sure that we know? Because unless we know the aim of our faithful high priest from the beginning of this great controversy to the very end in our generation, we will never see success in this time. We need to understand the aim of God. And so with that in mind, beloved, let us open our Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 23. In the book of Psalms, the 23rd chapter, I want us to begin thinking about the aim of God in this great controversy. You see, it is entirely possible for a man to be fighting a war days without end and to lose sight of the end goal. It is entirely possible for a man to fight a war to get tired, to be dehydrated, to be lacking in the things he needs, so much so that he loses sight. His priorities begin to scatter. He loses sight of the definite aim. But beloved, by the grace of God, if we would but take a chance, take a, a moment and just re-evaluate our situation, re-evaluate the great controversy from beginning to end, take a moment, then we can understand God's aim at this time and we can get up with renewed vigor, renewed strength, and by the grace of God, we can follow our high priest to the finishing of this work and to the cutting short of that same work in righteousness. In the book of Psalms chapter 23, the Bible tells us, beginning at verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. The Bible says he leadeth me in the path of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. First and foremost, beloved, God is able to restore the soul. And I'm thankful for that. God is able to restore the soul that trusts upon him. The Bible says he restoreth my soul and he does what? He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. Now, during this entire series, we have been studying that path. We have been studying the path of righteousness trodden before us by our faithful high priest, Jesus Christ. We have been trotting and watching the way of God that is in the sanctuary that has been walked before us by our faithful high priest, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God leads us in that path of righteousness to what end? The Bible says for his name's sake. Now, I want you to make note of that. I want you to make note of that, beloved. God has been leading us in the path of righteousness. Throughout this entire series, we have been seeing the path of righteousness. We have been seeing the steps of Christ that we may follow. But it has always been to an intent. There is something that God desires to accomplish. There is an aim to what God is doing. There is an aim, beloved, to walking the path of righteousness. And so if we lose sight of this aim, success becomes impossible. I'm going to repeat that. If we lose sight of the aim of God in leading us in the path of righteousness, then success becomes impossible impossible. Do we want God to succeed? Absolutely. We want the Lord to succeed even in our generation. In order to do that, beloved, success in any line demands a definite aim. Let's go back to the text. In verse 3 of Psalm 23, the Bible says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. Why? For His name's sake. For his name's sake, beloved, God has been doing this all the while for his name's sake. Now that word sake implies jeopardy. It implies that the name of God has been threatened. It implies that the name of God is at stake. Now we know uh, that the name signifies a, a great deal more than simply the title by which we call God. It's not simply the name Jesus Christ, because we know that with the name comes a mission. 
The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 that you would call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, the Bible says his name should be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. Every time God's name is called into question, beloved, there is a mission to be accomplished. And so here in Psalm 23, when the Bible says that he leads us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, you can be sure that the name of God, number one, is at jeopardy, the, no the name of God is at stake, and some mission must be accomplished in order to see that that name is protected. Are we understanding? Some mission ought to be accomplished in order to see that that name, the name of our high priest, the name of God is protected. Now, beloved, let's go to Psalms 106 and verse 8. We're studying the aim of God in leading us in the path of righteousness. The aim of God in sending that most precious message to Jones and Wagner in 1888, that message of righteousness by faith. Justification by faith, beloved. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 106 and verse 8, speaking of Israel, it says, Nevertheless, he saved them for what? His name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. Here in Psalms chapter 106 and verse 8, we see that God again has done something. He has saved Israel. Do you see that? He has saved Israel for his name's sake. Why? That he might make his mighty power to be known. Beloved, what is the power of God? In the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto all that believe. And so therefore, beloved, if the gospel of God is the power of God, and God has done something for his name's sake that he might make that power known, can we see that the name of God and the sake of that name entirely depend, the reputation of that name entirely depends on the preaching of the gospel. There's something about the gospel that is designed to secure the name of God, that is designed to vindicate the name of God. This is what it means to couple the words name and sake together. God's name has been threatened by the adversary of our souls, beloved, and the aim of God in our final generation, the aim all along, the aim when he saved Israel, the aim when he saved us at the cross by the grace of Jesus Christ has always been that his name would be vindicated by the proclamation of the gospel, the power of God. Is it clear? And so as we're moving along, I want us to keep that in mind, that the aim of God in all these things is for his name's sake. It is the proclamation of the gospel for his name's sake sake. It is the uplifting of the man Christ Jesus for his name's sake. It is the finishing of the mystery of godliness, the union of divinity and humanity in Christ for the name's sake of God. Let us not lose sight of that aim because the moment we lose sight of that aim, success becomes impossible. We're preaching the gospel, but to what end? What is, the, what is the motive of the proclamation of the gospel? As we preach it, are we simply seeking our salvation? Because, beloved, that's entirely selfish, and, and we know that sin originated in self-seeking. So you can preach the gospel, but if that is the underlying motive, that too must be cleansed. When we're preaching the gospel, is it simply the, the translation of the 144,000 that we're seeking? Because if that is so, then that too is self motive, and that must be cleansed. God needs a final generation of saints who are entirely moved by another motive, who are entirely moved by some other end that they are seeking to accomplish a new aim, beloved. And the aim of the 144,000 is the securing, the vindication, the clearing of the name of God. Somebody says, how do I know that? In the book of Revelation chapter 14, in the book of Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, And I looked, 
And lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1 that these members of the one hundred and forty-four thousand stand on the Mount Zion. Do you understand what that means? It means that after all of this great controversy, the 144,000 finally find themselves on higher ground. Beloved, you're not catching this. The 144,000 finally get the vantage ground over the enemy, beloved. How did they get it? They got it when their aim became entirely different than translation. They got it when their aim became entirely different than merely salvation. They got it when their aim became the vindication of the character of God. Thus, the name of the Father is written in each forehead of those who are in that number. Beloved, am I making myself clear? I want us to understand that success in any line demands a definite aim. What is your aim today? Today I'm gonna to be introducing you to the fourth angel of Revelation chapter 18, beloved. I'm going to be introducing you to the fourth angel. I know that we have heard about the first angel. We have heard about the second, we have heard about the third, and some of us have made mention of the fourth. But beloved, when we look at the fourth angel, there is an aim to be accomplished, an aim that if we lack, we can never successfully be a part of that movement. Beloved, we wanna be sure that we are on the side of Christ in this day of atonement. We want to be sure that his aim and our aim, that his motive and our motive is synonymous. Beloved, we don't need another aim. We don't need another aim. We don't need another mission. We need to understand the mission of Jesus at this time and be on board with that plan. What do you say? Let's go back in our Bibles. So now we're seeing in the book of Psalms, chapter 23 and verse 3, and in the book of Psalms, chapter 106 and verse 8, that the name of God has always been the focal point. He leads us in the path of righteousness for what? His name's sake. He saved Israel for what? His name's name's sake, and that his power might be made known. So the gospel, which is the power of God, is to be proclaimed in all this world as a witness for his name's sake. All right, I'm, I'm pressing this point because it's in, entirely impossible for you to get what we're going to talk about in this study unless you first have that foundation, that God's aim in all of this is the vindication of that name. Now in the book of Exodus chapter 33, going to some familiar points, some very familiar points with you. In the book of Exodus chapter 33, beginning at verse 17, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Moses responds, and he said, I beseech thee, show me what? Thy glory. Underline those words, beloved. Moses said, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim, key words, the name of the Lord. What did God promise to proclaim to Moses? The name of of the Lord. What did Moses ask to be shown? His glory. And so we're seeing now that the glory of God and the name of the Lord are synonymous. To talk about his name is to talk about his glory. To talk about his glory is to talk about his name. They are one and the same. So when we're reading in Psalms chapter 23 and verse 3 that he has led us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, can it also be said that he has led us in the path of righteousness for the sake of his glory? Beloved, they're synonymous. Am I making the point clear? So what we're seeing now is that God's aim in all of this is for his glory to be understood by you and I. And not only understood by you and I, but proclaimed to the world in such a way that this final generation finds themselves on higher ground, yea, even on the Mount Zion with the Lamb and the 144,000, beloved, having that very name, having that very glory written in our foreheads. Beloved, I'm getting excited even as I'm sharing this thing with you. Because you see, I, I have looked at these things before, but as I look at it even more, I am recognizing God's intent for me as well 
well as God's intent for you. Beloved, we are living in very serious times. We're living in times, beloved, where the entire world is screaming about injustice. The entire world is looking for righteousness in beings that simply cannot produce it. Do you understand that the only hope of this generation's doing anything for this world is in connection with the high priest in that most holy place at this time? Beloved, we need Jesus. Am I clear? We need this man such as never before. Beloved, there is a smile on my face because I'm seeing now more than ever that this man has designed a plan that incorporates us in such a way that though we need him, he needs us as well. You see, we need the character of God, we need the righteousness of Christ, and Christ needs these earthen vessels to proclaim that treasure. Beloved, do you see yourself in the picture? He is Emmanuel, God with us. It's not God with me or some other man, it is God with us. This includes you. And so as we're talking about the fourth angel, which we're about to get into now, as we're talking about answering the call in this generation, which we are about to do right now, I want you to know know, beloved, that this message is for you. This message has every intent on touching the heart of you. It has every intent, beloved, of giving the marching order of Christ to you and to me. Beloved, this thing is special, what we're about to look into today. The messages before have been wonderful, and I've have, I have, I have, I have gloried in the Lord's might. I have, I have, I've looked at this thing, and I've seen what Christ is to me and all these things, and I have been blessed, beloved. I pray that you have been blessed as well. And now, as we go even deeper into the message, beloved, as we take an even further look upon this man and this plan of God for our generation, my prayer is that you get on board. My prayer is that you find yourself on higher ground in Christ Jesus. Beloved, let me tell you something. It is impossible to abide in Christ and not have the vantage point. It is impossible to abide in Christ. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, the prince of this world cometh and find nothing where in me. And if the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 30 verses uh, 31, uh, 1 Corinthians, rather, chapter 1 and verses 30 and 31. If the Bible says that God has placed you and I there in Christ, then we are not the property of Satan. Beloved, we are simply out of reach. His arm does not reach that high. Beloved, Jesus... Mm, 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 mm. Jesus has secured us. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Jesus has secured us in such a way that if we would have him, if we would have and receive the marriage, Jesus has secured us in such a way that we are simply out of the reach of Satan. He will come to us, beloved, in this final generation at the passing of a National Sunday Law, and he will press every button in you and I. Beloved, are there buttons in you that could be pressed? When you're cut off on the road, is there a button there that can be pressed? How do you respond? Is racism a button in you that Satan can press? When he presses that, how do you respond? Beloved, if it is not the response of our faithful high priest, if it is not the response of Jesus, then we have yet to learn to abide in him. Because abiding in him means that Satan comes and finds nothing in you and I with which he can trigger a response. Beloved, the response that he will get from you and I will be that of our faithful high priest. It will be that of Christ. It will be that of Christ in you, the hope of glory. In the book of Exodus 34 and verse 5, the Bible says, And the Lord descended in the cloud, and stood with him, that is Moses, stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So now we're getting ready to see what the name of God is, what the glory of God is. The Bible says in verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him, and proclaimed, The Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Beloved, the Bible says that the name of God and the glory of God are synonymous. When God proclaimed to Moses the name of the Lord, in verse 7, he said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Now, beloved, 
can we see that the glory of God, the name of God, is simply the character of God? When God proclaimed that name, when he proclaimed that glory to Moses, it was the various characteristics, the features of that character that he presented. And so when we're talking about the aim of Christ in this generation, it concerns the vindication of the character of God. Is the point clear? The Bible says he leads us in the path of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake, for his glory's sake, or for the sake of his character. I want to give you some evidence from the spirit of prophecy regarding that. In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, paragraph 2, we are told, But the plan of redemption had yet a broader and a deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to do what? Vindicate the character of God before the universe. Beloved, we are told that the purpose of the plan of redemption, rather the deeper purpose of the plan of redemption, is the vindication of the character of God. And so I'll ask again, if success in any line demands a definite aim, what is your aim in joining the work of God? What is your aim in this generation in picking up the message of justification by faith that came through Jones and Wagner? Beloved, if the aim is not the vindication of the character of God, any other aim simply will not do. Because the aim of Christ all along has been the vindication of that name. Does it make sense? Is it clear? The vindication of God's character is the end. It is the all and all in this great controversy. That is what this thing is entirely about. And so in revealing the righteousness of Christ, it is that we may see exactly who God is and then demonstrate by our lives the very truth of that revelation. Beloved, this is who Jesus is. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he is the express image of the Father's person. Whenever you want to know what God looks like, you look to Christ. And Christ's intent in this generation is that when men would see who God is, they may look to you and I and see in us Christ, the hope of glory. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth where? In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Beloved, this personal Savior, this same Jesus, will do that for you and I if we keep in our vision the very definite aim of our high priest. And what is that aim? It is the vindication of the character, the name, the glory of God. Now I want you to keep that because now we're about to move forward. We're about to move forward into these calls. We're about to move forward into this fourth angel to understand the mission at this time. But we now see the aim. It is the vindication of the character of God. Now in the book of Habakkuk chapter two, I wanna show you a few final points on this thought. In the book of Habakkuk chapter two, God made a very special promise. And we know by now, beloved, that God always makes good on his promises. In the book of Habakkuk chapter two and verse 14, the Bible says this, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Beloved, do the seas cover this earth? Absolutely. The seas absolutely cover this earth. The Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14 that just as surely as that is so, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall fill the entire earth. What is the knowledge of the glory of the Lord? It is the knowledge of the name of the Lord. It is the knowledge of the character of God. The Bible promised in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14 that God would see to it that in our generation this would be so. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 18 at verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven. Where did this angel come from, beloved? This angel came down from heaven 
having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1 that this other angel who comes down from heaven out of the most holy place from where Jesus is, beloved, that's where this angel comes from, he comes down on a mission to do what? Lighten the entire earth with the glory of God. Lighten the entire earth with the name of God. He lightens the entire earth with the character of of God. That is the mission of this angel found in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. And we're going to take some time now looking at this specific angel. But before we do that, I have a question for you. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 4 and 5, the Bible told us concerning the nature of love, concerning the nature of God, because God is love. Amen. The Bible told us that love seeketh not her own. Love seeketh not her own. Anything that God does, it is, it is with a, a motive entirely different from self-seeking. It has nothing to do with himself. And so if God is seeking the vindication of his name, if God is seeking the vindication of his character in our generation, my question is, what is his underlying motive? In the book Great Controversy, page 493 and paragraph 2, we are given the answer. We are told that the law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all created beings depended upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, homage that springs from an intelligent appreciation of what? His character. God takes no pleasure in a forced allegiance, and to all he grants freedom of will that they may render to him voluntary service. What kind of service? Voluntary service. So here we see that homage to God, obedience to God, springs from an intelligent appreciation of his character. Beloved, unless the character of God is first vindicated, that homage, which springs from an intelligent appreciation of that character, could never be secured. Are we getting the point? God is not seeking his own. The Bible says that love seeketh not her own. He is not seeking the vindication of himself for himself. He is seeking the vindication of himself for you and I. Beloved, in order to secure us in obedience, in order to secure the entire universe from the consequences of sin and unrighteousness, God must be vindicated before the entire universe so that the intelligent appreciation of that knowledge, the intelligent appreciation of that name, the intelligent appreciation of that glory of his character would forever secure us in appreciation to him in voluntary service. Is it clear? Now we're going to pick up where we left off two studies ago. In the Ellen G. White 1888 materials on page 734, paragraph 2, in a letter to Uriah Smith, the prophet said this, I thought I would make one more appeal to you. I have talked with you, but it seemed to do no good. I have written to you, but it made you only go further and deeper in resistance of the Spirit of God. You responded to my letter of appeal by writing me a letter accusing Elder Jones of tearing up the pillars of our faith. Was this truth? You accused him wrongfully. Have you confessed this? Have you cleared your own soul? She says, Christ knocked for entrance, but no room was made for him. The door was not opened, catch this, and the light of his glory, the light of what? The light of his glory so nigh was withdrawn. Sister White says that in response to the 1888 rejection of that message, the light of God's glory, the light of God's name, the light of God's character so nigh, so close was what? Withdrawn. Now the question is that we left off in the last study, would that light ever return? In the book of Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 through 4, we saw that we have a prophetic right to claim that that light would return even in our generation. The entire earth is to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Revelation 18 and verse 1 says that the angel that comes then will get the job done. Beloved, hallelujah. Amen? Hallelujah. We are not 
to guess at anything. Now, another statement here in Spiritual Gifts Volume 1, I told you I'd be introducing you to the fourth angel, and that is precisely what I intend to do. In the book Spiritual Gifts Volume 1, page 193 in paragraph 2 through 194 in paragraph 1, we are told, I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. They were descending to earth and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw, keyword, another. She saw what? She says, I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to earth and to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. Pause there for a moment. Sister White says that she saw another angel commissioned to unite his voice with that of the third angel. Now question. If it is another angel which unites his voice with that of the third angel, is this angel the third angel? No, beloved. It's another angel. Amen? It must be another angel. Now, I'm going to let you know this right now. Nowhere in the Bible and nowhere in the spirit of prophecy will you find this other angel identified as the fourth angel. But we conclude that he's the fourth angel by numerical sequence. It only makes sense, beloved, that if the first angel was followed by the other angel, it would be the second angel. And if the second angel was followed by the third, then the angel that follows and unites his voice with that of the third angel must be the fourth angel in this numerical sequence. Does it make sense? But she says, then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to earth and to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. So this fourth angel unites with the third. Did you see that? The fourth angel does not do some work that is separate from the third. That is not what's going on. The fourth angel unites with the third. Those who are doing the work of the third angel are to be joined by those who are doing the work of the fourth angel. And the fourth angel will give power and force to the message of the third. Is it clear? That is why the fourth angel's message is known as the loud cry of Revelation chapter 18 and verses 1 through 4. Beloved, it simply takes what the third has, it polishes it, it, it amplifies it, and it gives it to the entire world in newness of power. The Bible said that this angel came down having what? Great power, beloved, and the earth was lightened with his glory. She says, great power and glory were imparted to the angel. And as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which went before and followed after this angel penetrated everywhere as he cried mightily with a strong voice. The work of this angel, which angel? The fourth angel. The work of this angel comes in when? At the right time. Pause there, beloved. She says that the work of the fourth angel comes in at the right time. The fourth angel shows up right on time. Do you suppose that those that are involved with this fourth angel would have to have an accurate knowledge of the time? Yes, they would. In order for that work to join the third right on time. Beloved, I pray that you're catching what I'm saying. The fourth angel's work is to show up right on time. Everything Jesus did was calculated by time. Everything Jesus did was calculated by time. The Bible says in the fullness of time, Jesus came. In the fullness of time, beloved. And so we're seeing that in this final generation, God needs those among Israel who have a knowledge of the time that they may know what Israel ought to do. And the work of the fourth angel will come in right on time to unite with that of the third. Beloved, I like that word, unite, because it shows that the work of the fourth angel is not to separate that which is here already. No, beloved, the work of the fourth angel is to unite the work of God as it is right now upon the earth. That is the purpose of the message of justification by faith. That is the message of Jones and Wagner that came in 1888. And as it advances in its glory, beloved, the end result is the union of the faith. She says the work of this angel comes in at the right time and joins in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells into a loud cry. And the people of God are what? 
fitted up everywhere to stand. Do you remember two messages ago, we saw that the union of humanity and divinity is the marriage that we are seeking at this time. We saw that the garment of Christ's righteousness is the fitting up to be fit guests at that wedding. Now we're told that when the fourth angel unites with the third, it says, and the people of God are what? Fitted up everywhere to stand. So the fourth angel, beloved, accomplishes this work of calling God's people to the marriage. The fourth angel accomplishes this work of calling God's people to the marriage, to receive the man Christ Jesus, beloved. That is the work of the fourth angel. We are told, and the people of God are fitted up everywhere to stand in the hour of temptation, which they are soon to meet. I saw great light resting upon them, and they united in the message. We're not seeking division, beloved, but unity in Christ, unity in truth, and that unity is found nowhere but in the man Christ Jesus. She says, they united in the message and fearlessly proclaimed with great power the third angel's message. Pause there for a moment. What is it that the unity between the fourth and the third produces? What do they preach? They preach the third angel's message. Now, don't miss this point. We know that the third angel's message, according to inspiration, the third angel's message in verity is that message that Jones and Wagner brought back in the year 1888. It is the message of justification by faith. That is the third angel's message in verity. The words in verity imply that, that, that there's no better definition of what the third angel's message is. Now we know the third angel has many different components to his message. There's the warning against the beast, against his mark, against his image, right? There's the warning against the wrath of God. There are all of these things contained in the third. These are all components. But the message itself, we are told in verity, is the message of justification by faith as presented through elders A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner in the year 1888. This is significant because now we're seeing that they united in the message and fearlessly proclaimed with great power the third angel's message. That is the message, beloved, for this time. That is the message for this generation. I'm going to repeat myself because by the grace of God, I want to make this abundantly clear. I want to make this abundantly clear, not only by the evidences of the word of God, but by the evidences of the spirit of prophecy. Beloved, I want you to see and to be sure that the work for this time is the proclamation of that message. Now, if we don't understand what that message is yet, beloved, then I pray again that we will make use of the uh, resources below right here in the description of this video. There are resources, beloved. The 1895 sermons, the 1893 sermons by A.T. Jones, Lessons on Faith by Jones and Wagner, Christ Our Righteousness. Beloved, there are so many resources available to us today. The Word of God says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Beloved, let us not waste our time. If we know what is to be presented, let us make sure we know the message itself so that we may present it aright. What do you say? She says, they united in the message and fearlessly proclaimed with great power the third angel's message. Now catch this point. She says, this message, what message? The third angel's message. The third angel's message, beloved, that resulted from the unity of the fourth angel and the third angel. She says, this message, keyword, seemed to be an addition to the third message and joined it. Pause there for a moment, beloved. Please catch this point. We know that the unity of the fourth angel with the third angel's message, right, results in a unity and a proclamation of whose message? The third angel's message. The message of Jones and Wagner on justification by faith is the resulting message of the unity between the fourth angel, that other angel of Revelation 18, right? And the third angel's message. But now we're seeing that this message, which they proclaim together, seems to be an addition to the third message. Now, why would the prophet say that? Why would the prophet say, beloved, and we believe she's a prophet, amen? 
we believe that she had the inspired gift from God when she said that this message seemed to be an addition to the third, what was she saying? Do you remember that quotation I shared with you a few studies back where inspiration told us that there would be those who call the third angel's message a, a, a false light and refuse to move on with its advancing glory? The Bible says that these things are to go from one level to the next, from glory to glory, beloved. We are to advance with the procession. We are to advance in our understanding of the righteousness of Christ. Do you suppose that in looking at the righteousness of Christ, better views of who God actually is as seen in Christ would become known? Absolutely, beloved. If the entire great controversy centers around the vindication of God's character, when God finally has a generation that begin to look upon the righteousness of Christ, that begin to look upon Christ himself and study who he is in every feature of that character, beloved, new and improved views would come forth about the character of God. You see, there are things that we didn't see before when we looked to Calvary. Inspiration says, but when we look to Calvary now, in every ray that streams from Calvary's cross, as we look there, the very attributes of God that once fear filled us with fear become lovely, beloved. Let me tell you something, Jesus is attractive. And we need to understand that as we study the message of Jones and Wagner, as we begin to look at that message of righteousness, in fact, Jones called it a message of righteousness according to righteousness. What that means is that we would begin to study Christ, not as we want him to be, all right, but as he is. And the picture of God that we have as a result would begin to improve until we had the perfect picture of the Father, the Father that the Son himself presented. And beloved, when that picture becomes the picture that you and I have accurately, that name is written in our foreheads. And let me tell you, once it is written there, no man can take it away. This is why inspiration says, this message seemed to be an addition to the third message. I want to park there again. The fact that she said this message, the message of the fourth angel joining with the third in the proclamation of the third angel's message, she says this message seemed to be an apparent addition. The fact that she said seemed implies that it is not. What the fourth angel brings to the third, beloved, seems to be an addition to the third, but it is not. It is not, it's not something in addition to, it's an improving upon, it is a building upon, it is an advancing upon the third angel's message. The fourth angel doesn't bring some other message. The fourth angel does not bring some other Jesus. It is this same Jesus, but the longer you look upon this man, Beloved, I'm telling you, the longer that you look upon this man, the greater, the deeper, the higher your understanding of the depth and the breadth of the loving character of God. Beloved, is it plain? I, I don't want to spend too much uh, time on that point because we do still have further to go. And I promised you that we would be getting to the calls in this generation today. She says, this message seemed to be an addition to the third message and joined it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. Beloved, do you remember the work of S.S. Snow in 1844? Do you remember the work of the midnight cry in 1844? She, she, she responds in letting us know that the work of the fourth in relation to the third is similar to the work of the midnight cry when it joined that of the second angel in 1844. In 1844, beloved, the cry went forth, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to do what? Meet him. That was the work of the midnight cry that joined the second angel. That was the work of the midnight cry that joined the second angel, she says right here. So the work of the fourth angel that joins the third angel in finishing the work, she says, is similar as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. Now I want to share with you this quotation here. This quotation here takes what she said there and puts it into perspective. Whereas the midnight cry, that message, was, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye forth to meet him. The message of the fourth angel is similar. She says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 415 in paragraph 5, Those who wait for who? The bridegroom's coming. 
She said, those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. Now, some of you may be asking yourselves, Brother Paul, I thought the purpose of this series was to show that the message of justification by faith is the last message. I thought the last message was the message of Christ, our righteousness. Beloved, she's saying nothing different here. By saying that the last rays of merciful light the last message is a revelation of God's character of love. She is simply pointing you to that which you would find in the righteousness of Christ. Beloved, do you suppose that if we're looking at the righteousness of Christ, we would receive better and improved views on the righteousness, the character, the glory, the name of God? Absolutely. That is simply what is being said here. She says, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. And so as we look at the righteousness of Christ, we receive fresh improved views of who God is by Jesus Christ. He is the express image of the Father's person. And so that is exactly what we should expect. That is precisely what we should anticipate if our eyes are upon his righteousness. In Selected Messages, Book 1, page 362, paragraph 4, we are told, The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. What is that word? Begun. That means it starts. It begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. For it is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come to lift up Jesus, to present him to the world as revealed in the types, as shadowed in symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets, as unveiled in the lessons given to his disciples and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of him. Beloved, inspiration says that the work of Jones and Wagner in uplifting Christ, in presenting Christ our righteousness, was the beginning. It was the start of the work of that fourth angel. It was the beginning, it was the start. In uplifting Christ as these men did, the sin-pardoning Redeemer, beloved, it was the beginning of the work of that fourth angel. That fourth angel is to swell from that beginning, all right? It is to advance from that beginning. Do you remember an inspiration where Sister White said that the, the third angel's message would not be comprehended? That the light that will lighten the entire earth with his glory will be called a false light? by those who refuse to advance with its glory. Beloved, this is where we find ourselves. The message of Jones and Wagner was the starting point, the beginning of the thing. But it is to advance, it is to swell, it is to develop upon that foundation. Is it clear? And what is the ending of, uh, from the beginning? She says, the last rays of merciful light, the last message to be given to the world is a revelation. So in the righteousness of Christ, there is a revelation of the character of God we are to understand. Amen? A.T. Jones says this. In the third angel's message, 1893 sermons, he says on page 185, paragraph 5, there will be things to come that will be more surprising than that was to those at Minneapolis. What do you mean, Brother Jones? Brother Jones is saying that there would be things to come after him and Wagner, right? That would be more surprising to us than what Jones and Wagner brought to us. Now, why is that? Because we were to advance from what they brought. We were to uh, develop upon the foundation that they laid. The Holy Spirit would lead us deeper and higher and wider in our influence by that very foundation he laid through Jones and Wagner. There will be things to come that will be more surprising than that was to those at Minneapolis. More surprising than anything we have yet seen. And brethren, we will be required to receive and to preach 
that truth. What truth, Brother Jones? The truth that is more surprising than that which was brought to Minneapolis. The truth that results from the development of that foundation that was laid at Minneapolis. Beloved, that truth is to be received, he says. He says, we will be required to receive and preach that truth, but unless you and I have every fiber of that spirit, that is the, 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 the root of the opposition of that message. Unless you and I have every fiber of that spirit rooted out of our hearts, we will treat that message and the messenger by whom it is sent, as God has declared, we have treated this other message. Jones says that after the work of he and Wagner, there would come things that were more surprising. All right? But we know in principle that the Holy Spirit does not contradict himself. Whenever he brings truth further along down the line, it is a development of the truth he brought before. All right? When Moses brought his truth, it wasn't to negate whatever truth Joseph had preached in Egypt or whatever truth Jacob had preached Joseph. These things are developments upon one another. What Abraham had, all right, was developed and improved by Isaac, all right, which was developed and improved by Jacob and so forth and so forth until the final generation. God gives light to one man, beloved, and he develops the understanding of that man's posterity further on down the line. Truth is progressive. Are we understanding the point? And so the foundation that was laid concerning Christ our righteousness in 1888 was to develop and to advance into a more thorough understanding of who God is as presented in Christ our righteousness. By beholding him, we behold the Father. Beloved, these are the things we are to expect. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you have not yet seen the Father? Have I been with you so long in the, in the writings of Jones and Wagner and you have not yet seen the Father? Beloved, how long must we study the writings of Jones and Wagner and still not see clearly who God is? Anyone who studies the, the writings of Jones and Wagner, anyone who studies the writings of 1888, beloved, will let you know that their vision of who God is has improved. It has been developed. Beloved, listen, inspiration tells us that the things about God that made us fearful, when we look at the light that streams from Calvary, we see that love and justice and mercy and all those things are blended. And rather than fear, there is awe. There is a love. Beloved, there's something about Calvary that changes the response of sinners to that consuming fire. Now, I told you in a, in, a, in a message before, I think it was the message before last, I told you that in Christ, we may meet that consuming fire and we may do so safely. God is a consuming fire. He will consume sin to wherever it is. But when we meet that consuming fire in Christ Jesus, that consuming fire is a threat to the sin alone that binds you and I. And as we remain in Christ, he makes us free right there. Beloved, these views of God only come from a thorough understanding, a thorough investigation into the righteousness of Christ. As we look at Christ, beloved, who we think the Father is, is entirely changed into the correct image. For Jesus is the express image of the Father. All right? In the manuscript releases, volume 11, page 283, paragraph 3 through 4, we are told, The Lord has shown me that we are in just as much danger of rejecting the truth in our day as were the people in the days of Christ. The Lord is speaking through his delegated messengers, Jones and Wagner. But the same unbelief is exhibited. Men close their hearts against Jesus and hold themselves in the veriest bondage to Satan. Beloved, inspiration told us that the message that Jones and Wagner presented is the third angel's message in verity. And so the rejection of that message leaves us in the veriest bondage to Satan. She says, men close their hearts against Jesus and hold themselves in the veriest bondage to Satan, supposing that they are preserving their dignity as free men. Those who on special occasions of controversy have taken a course similar to that of the men of Nazareth should take heed lest they follow their example. Keyword, when. Did the prophet say if? No. You see, to say if, 
is to suggest that it is a possibility. But when you say the word when, it means that we are to expect what she says next to actually take place. She says, those who on special occasions of controversy have taken a course similar to those of the men of Nazareth should take heed lest they follow their example when a second opportunity. A what? A second opportunity is given to accept the glorious light of truth. Sister White tells us that there would be a second opportunity to receive the glorious light of truth. Beloved, the first opportunity was through Jones and Wagner in what year? 1888. Now we're being told that there would be a second opportunity to receive the light of truth. She says, after the first rejection, when excitement and confusion are over, you may again be what? Called. Beloved, we're talking about the final call and the final generation. She says, you may again be called upon by the divine messenger, and you should beware lest you harden your hearts in prejudice and pride and in what? Final rejection of the message that would work for your salvation. Beloved, inspiration says that the first rejection was when? 1888. She says there would be a second opportunity, and now we're seeing that if we were to reject it during that second opportunity, during that second calling, it would be the final rejection of the message. Our question now is where are we in light of this statement? Beloved, are we living during the time of the first rejection in 1888? Absolutely not. Are we living in the time of the second opportunity? Follow on. We want to talk about the return of the fourth angel's light. She said there would be a second opportunity, so we want to understand the return of the fourth angel's light. In the book of Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15, through Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 through 3, we read the following. I will read it first and then we will break it down. The Bible says, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. Beloved, here in Hosea chapter 5 verse 15 through Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 through 3, we are dealing with the message of the latter rain. We are dealing with the message of the latter rain. The message of the latter rain, we've already covered in studies past, was the message of Jones and Wagner. The message of Christ our righteousness is the beginning of the loud cry. It was the beginning of the latter rain. That is what we're talking about here. Verse 3 confirms it where it said, If we follow on to know the Lord, His going forth is prepared as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter, and the former rain unto the earth. So this entire thing that we're talking about here, this entire uh, segment of scripture, is in reference to that message. It is in reference to that angel that comes down and lightens the entire earth with His glory. The loud cry angel, the latter rain angel. That's what we're talking about. Now on the screen here, we're going to have a little breakdown. This passage is in reference to the latter rain angel of Revelation 18 as evidenced by verse 3. The fourth angel was withdrawn or returned to his place because of the offense of the 1888 rejection. This withdrawal wasn't to last forever, but only till, the Bible said, we repented and received the message that we had rejected. The work of the fourth angel is symbolized by how many days? Three days. Go back down to the text right here. It says, after two days will God do what? Revive us, and in the 
third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. So the Bible says that there are three days in total concerning the opportunity to receive that latter rain message. Concerning the opportunity to receive that righteousness of Christ, there would be three opportunities. Three days, three callings, all right? In the first two days, the Bible said in Hosea chapter 6, the Bible said after two days he would revive us. So the first two days are for the purpose of reviving God's church. But the third day, the Bible said, he would raise us up and we would be doing what? Living in his sight. So the work of the fourth angel is symbolized by three days, two of which are specifically to revive us and a third in which he will raise us up to proclaim the message, and we will live in his sight. In that third and final day, following the advancing light of the third angel's message of Christ's righteousness, produces a people who know the Lord. They actually know his character, who know the Lord, which will surely result in his going forth, as seen in Joel chapter 2 and verse 16. And in that third day, both the power of the early and the latter rain are to be expected. Now, that's quite a mouthful. I know that there's a lot that I just said there. There's a lot to unpack there. We're going to spend some time here now. That's, that's where the, we're going to spend the rest of our time, actually. We're going to spend our time here in Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, and Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15. The Bible said that there would be three days, three opportunities, three callings, two in which God's intention was to revive His people. The third in which God's intention was to raise up his people, right, to prepare them to stand. If he's raised you up, can you be falling? No, beloved. In the third day, we are expected to be standing because he's raised us up, right? And we are to live in his sight. Inspiration says that we are to live in the sight of God without a mediator. We're going to get there in a moment. That is the purpose of the third day. Now, on the screen here, we see that these three days, day one, Day two and day three represent these opportunities. We're going to focus on day one and day two, which is for the revival of God's church. On day one, the fourth angel comes to revive us from our lukewarm condition. That is precisely what took place in 1888. The message of Jones and Wagner was the message of God to the Laodicean church. It was designed to cure us of lukewarmness and to restore in us the Philadelphian love that we had lost, the love of Christ, our righteousness. That message was rejected and the angel returned to his place. Sister White said the glory was withdrawn until repentance is made. Now, inspiration said that there would be a second day of opportunity. The fourth angel returns in the second day. The message is given again to our leading men. And if the message is rejected again, it would be what inspiration called the final rejection of the message from our leadership. On day three, beloved, there is a work to be done for the world. On day three, there is a work to be done for the world. The Bible said the Lord would raise up his church and that we would be living in his sight. The Bible said that following on to know the Lord would result in the outpouring of the early and the latter rain in its power. That is precisely what we read here in Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. All right? Now, what we want to understand is those first two days. We want to spend some time on the first two days, the first two callings, the first two opportunities. On day one, we have A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner in the year 1888, through the 1890s, giving the message of Christ our righteousness. The purpose of that message in that day, according to Hosea chapter 6, was to revive God's church. Jones and Wagner went straight to the general conference. They were dealing with the leadership of this church. Now on day two, we have these two men on our screen. One on the left is named Donald K. Short. And the one on the right is known as Robert J. Whelan. These men are responsible for this work here that I have. 1888, re-examined. This work right here, beloved, is a wonderful work of the Holy Spirit. 
Robert J. Willand and Donald K. Short are responsible for this. They were responsible for shifting the focus of our leading men in the 1950s back to that most important message, that most precious message of justification by faith as presented through Jones and Wagner. In this book, beloved, I pray that you get it. I'm gonna leave a link down below in the description of this video. In this book, as well as other books, I also have 1888, an introduction. In these books, Robert Wieland and Donald K. Short directed the attention of our leading men to the message of justification by faith, back to the message that that fourth angel was seeking to bring in the 1800s. Unfortunately, the message was not received by the leading men. Repentance was not made by the leading men, beloved. And so the message was again rejected. That was day two. That was the second opportunity. These men are represented by the second day of opportunity. But we're not living in the 1800s, are we? No. And we're not living in the 1900s either. We're not living in day one and we're not living in day two. We find ourselves in the year 2020 and we're going to get into what that means in just a moment. But I want to bring to your memory Matthew chapter 22, where there were three distinct set of servants that the king sent to, 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 to bid the people to come to the marriage, to come to the wedding. There were three sets of servants. The first two sets of servants, beloved, when you study Matthew 22, had the exact same audience. But the third set of servants in Matthew chapter 22 had a different audience altogether. The king told them personally, your audience is not the same as the servants that came before you. The first, second, the first and the second set of servants had to address a specific audience. And after those days were passed, after those callings were passed, after those opportunities had passed, beloved, the third set of servants had a different audience altogether. I am reminded of the days of John the Baptist. When John the Baptist was pointing the people to who? Christ our righteousness, he was beheaded. I'm reminded of the days of Jesus Christ when he was showing them that he is the Lamb of God. He showed them all the things in the scriptures concerning himself. He was crucified. And after those two opportunities right there, beloved, we know that the disciples on the day of Pentecost again gave the message of Christ and his righteousness. But you will notice that the disciples on the day of Pentecost had no specific burden to go to Caiaphas. No specific burden to address the leadership. They were dealing with the individuals. Jesus told them to abide in Jerusalem. Because while Caiaphas and them had rejected Christ, there were individuals in the church of God at that time who still had opportunity to make a decision for themselves. Now, am I saying that we're living in a time where God is not seeking to reach leadership at the general conference? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, beloved. I would not close probation against any man. As long as time continues, as long as we are on this side of the Sunday law, there is hope for the Seventh-day Adventists. Any individual who will receive the message of Christ and his righteousness, praise the Lord, there is time even now. What I am saying, beloved, is that the third set of servants in Matthew chapter 22 were dealing with the individuals now. Their burden of their message wasn't necessarily to the leadership. They, they, they were dealing with the individuals. The Bible says to every one grass in the field. Every individual, that is the burden of the third set of servants. Beloved, we are living in the day of the third set of servants here in 2020. I'm going to show you that. We are living in the third day. We're living in the third opportunity. And beloved, we, we need to understand that in the first two days, what was God trying to accomplish? In Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 through 3, what was God trying to accomplish? The revival of the church. Who did he send his messengers to? Jones and Wagner went to the general conference. Wheeland and Short went to the general conference. In this third day, God is knocking at every individual heart. If you hear his voice today, beloved, harden not your heart as we did in the days of provocation. Beloved, the time is now. Back to the screen. The word revive, we want to spend some time on that. The word revive means to restore to life. To do what? To restore to life. Now, if God was seeking to restore us to life 
through the message he sent through these men, it implies that we were dead in sin and trespasses. The purpose of the message of justification by faith, beloved, was to invite us to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God, to restore us to life. The word also means to resuscitate or to give new strength. That angel in Revelation 18 and verse 1 who comes down from heaven having great power gives new strength to the church. Great power, beloved. The purpose of reviving God's people is accomplished by the mission of that other angel who comes down in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1 with great power illuminating the earth with his glory. Can you see it? Now that word resuscitate is very dear to me uh, because in my line of work we have something called CPR in which you need at least two people to revive someone who has reached cardiac arrest. The heart has stopped beating. The blood is no longer flowing. The individual is dying and you are seeking to revive them or to resuscitate them. So one person gives 30 compressions, pumping the heart, all right? And the other person is to give breath. And the moment that the person is revived, life is restored, praise the Lord. Now what's interesting enough, it's just an interesting point. In 1888, God sent how many people? Jones and Wagner, that is two. Two first responders, praise the Lord. In the 1950s, how many first responders did God send? He sent DK Short, he sent RJ Whelan, he sent two first responders so that CPR could be done appropriately, praise the Lord. Beloved, we're living in a generation where God is seeking to revive us so that we may live in his sight, so that he may raise us up so that he can finish the work. That's where we're living. And in order to do that, God needs the common people. That third set of servants are not focused merely upon the leadership of this church. No, 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 beloved. They're focused on every one blade of grass in the field. Every individual that will receive. The Bible says, I knock at the door. If any man, if any individual, if any one person will open the door, God will come in and will sup with him and will have fellowship with him. Beloved, the third set of servants are not concerned merely with the leadership of our church. They're dealing with the individual hearts that receive the message. And the reason why is for the same reason in Christ's day, God sought to use the fishermen, the common folk, the common people. Inspiration tells us that in the last great work, few great men will be used. It doesn't say none will be used. It says few of them will be used. And the reason why, beloved, is because as a result of the rejection of this message in 1888, as a result of the rejection of this message in the 1950s, we have found ourselves in a position where God's people are very independent of Him. This is why inspiration says that God is going to have to do something that is going to make it evidently clear that He has taken the reins into His old hands. His own hands, beloved. He's going to have to work in a way that is very out of the common order of things. Beloved, we are dealing with the individual fishermen of today. Beloved, I am a fisherman by the grace of God. I've already told you this before. And I will continue to fish until my nets are full for the kingdom of the Lord so that Jesus can come back in this final generation. Let us break this thing down even further. The Bible says that we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, but restoration in life only comes in Christ our righteousness. In the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, the Bible says, In Him, where? In Him we live and we move and we have our being. So in order to bring revival to us in the first two days, God would need a message that placed us in Christ. Do you see that? The message of Jones and Wagner, the message of Wheeland and Short in the 1950s, the message of the righteousness of Christ is exactly where we find ourselves in Jesus. It is in Christ where we find him. And because we find ourselves there, we may live. We live in him. We move in him. We have our being in him. Beloved, is the point clear? I pray that the point is very, very clear. So we see that the first two days, the first two callings, the first two opportunities through A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, through Robert Wheeland and D.K. Short, were designed to give victory over sin through Christ our righteousness. Now again I say, we're not living in the 1800s, are we? Nor are we living in the 1950s. We are living in the year 2020. And so the question is, beloved, what are we to expect in this generation? 
What are we to expect of God in this day, in this opportunity that we find ourselves now? The Bible said that God would raise us up and we would live in his sight. That's what Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 said. It said that we would be raised up and we would live in his sight. Question, what happens when God raises us up? What happens when God actually prepares a people to stand? When he raises us up and we are no longer falling, what is the result of his raising us up? In the book of Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 through 4 we are told, Arise! Shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory. What is his glory, beloved? That is his name. That is his character. It says, his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall Come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Beloved, what happens when God raises us up in the third day? It says the Gentiles will come, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Do you see that? So in the third day, God is expecting the loud cry to transition from the education of his people to the power and demonstration to the world, to the Gentiles, to the kings, to every man, nation, kindred, tribe, and people. Do you see that? In the third day, we are to expect the finishing of God's work. In the third calling, we are to expect the finishing of God's work. Beloved, we are living in that day. We are living in the day of the third servants. We are living in the day of the third opportunity, of the third calling. And while we tabernacle, while we abide right now at Jerusalem, because the Lord does not work now to bring many into the church, we know that. But while we tabernacle in Jerusalem right now, dealing with individuals, not merely the leadership, but with the individuals who will receive the righteousness of Christ, while we tarry, we are to expect that God will raise us up to live in his sight, and the result of that raising us up will be the coming of the Gentiles and the kings to the brightness of our rising. Beloved, what a wonderful hope we have in this generation. What a wonderful expectancy. Beloved, God always makes good on his promises. Always. The Bible says, The Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. In the book Early Writings, page 71, in paragraph 1, we are told, I also saw that many do not realize what they must say in or Is that what it says? No, let me read it again. I also saw that many do not realize what they must preach. Is that what it says? No. She says, many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Beloved, the third day in Hosea chapter 6, where the Bible says that God would raise us up and we would live in his sight, is saying that in the third day, in this calling, in this opportunity, God is raising up individuals to be, not simply to preach, but to be what they have preached, beloved. To actually live what they believe. The Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. It'll actually be the reality of their lives. And when that happens, the Bible says, we will live in his sight. Inspiration says that means we will live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. Do we see this? Christ in his sanctuary, page 153 in paragraph 1, we're told again, those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to do what? Stand. They're to do what? Stand. Beloved, if you are standing, are you falling? No. 
So then if God has raised you up, you will stand. We are talking about the third day. She says, when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above, we are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. She says, their robes must be what? Spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Beloved, in our past two studies, uh, two studies ago, we spoke about the message of those servants in Matthew 22, the message of the robe of Christ's righteousness. Now, if our robes are to be spotless, do we need to be afraid if we've received the robe of Christ? Absolutely not. The robe of Christ is our fitting up for the marriage. Do you see this? She says, through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle of with evil. They must what? Be conquerors. Beloved, I have so much hope when I read these quotations because I know that the word says that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Beloved, we are more than conquerors in Christ. She says we ought to be conquerors, but the message of Jones and Wagner presents us in such a way that we are more than that, more than conquerors through him that loved us. Why, beloved? Because where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. We are much more than conquerors in Jesus. There is much more than salvation in Jesus, much more than translation in Jesus. There is the vindication of the character of God in him. Beloved, and we are invited to partake. This is the purpose of the procession, the purpose of the three calls, the purpose of these three days, these three opportunities. It is the reception of Christ our righteousness, and in receiving that righteousness, okay, by studying that character, you and I, by beholding, are changed into the image of Jesus fully, so much so in this third day that we are raised up, no longer falling, and we can live in the sight of a holy God without an, a mediator. Beloved, if there is no mediator in the sanctuary above for you and I, then the work of the mediator for you and I must be completed. If there is no high priest working for you and I in the third day, then you and I have to have the work of the high priest completed. Do we understand? When Jesus steps out of that most holy place, you and I must be in a condition that entirely reflects his character. As a matter of fact, if you're students of prophecy, students of the spirit of prophecy, then you know that Seventh-day Adventists specifically must be in that condition by the passing of a national Sunday law. Beloved, there is no time to waste. But we may redeem the time even today. We may receive the man even today because the plan has always been receive Christ Jesus. What do you say? So we find ourselves right here on this third day where we are to be conquerors by the grace of God. I believe that God is still preparing a people right now. He's still preparing us. He's still pre we, are, we are in no means what we ought to be just yet. But he is getting that work done. And like I said, beloved, he always makes good on his promises. Always. God is not going to fail us. All right? The Bible says, faithful is he who begun to work and he was, he's going to finish that work, beloved. He's going to do so perfectly. I promise you. Never mind my promise. The word of God promises you. We saw in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1 that the world will be lightened with his glory. The question is, are you on board? Are you on board? Beloved, are these just, just, just other Bible studies to you? Or are we really recognizing that God is preparing us for something specific, for the vindication of his character, that you and I are actually called at this time to be a part of that number, a part of the 144,000, those who have his name, his character, his glory written in their foreheads and proclaimed by the very lives that they now live. Beloved, we need this man. And I'm so thankful that we find ourselves right here because being here, Studying this thing even now is evidence that the calling is upon you and it is upon me even now. We find ourselves here in day three. In the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 311, paragraph three and four, we are told, only, what is that word? Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering, the robe of his own righteousness, 
Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. Beloved, therefore, our job at this time is to make sure that we are among that company who are repenting and believing this message of Christ our righteousness. Why? Because God will put that robe on every repenting, believing soul. I counsel thee, he says, to buy of me white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. This robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character and this character, which character beloved? The character that Christ wrought out in his humanity. And this character, which character beloved? The character that Christ wrought perfectly in his humanity. This character he offers to impart to us. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him, where? In Him is no sin. By His perfect obedience, He has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes one with His mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to Him. We live His life. Beloved, catch these points. Two studies ago, we saw that Christ Himself is the union of divinity and humanity. That is the marriage, amen? He is Emmanuel, God with us. Christ is the marriage. Now we're seeing that if we would but submit, beloved, our hearts would be united, our wills would be merged, our minds would become one. This is the marriage. Inspiration is telling us that receiving and participating in that marriage hinges upon whether or not you and I submit. It's a very simple word, beloved, but for many of us, it's a very difficult process. Submit. You see, we're in a great controversy. We are in a war. And Jesus is the only person that we find victory through submission. Every other fight, every other war, the only way you win is by a, a, a strenuous effort to overcome the other person. Beloved, no, no, no. The only way we win this war is in submitting to Christ. The Bible says in our weakness, His strength is made perfect. Beloved, are you weak? If you are, beloved, then I tell you right now, you are in the perfect condition. You are qualified to receive the gospel of Jesus this afternoon. You are qualified to receive the gospel of Christ even now. That is where you ought to be. And the promise is that in that weakness, God acknowledges and His strength is made perfect, you will be victorious. But beloved, if we think we are strong, if we think we are strong, then we do not need the strength of that other angel. We don't need the strength of the loud cry angel if we are strong. And this is why it flies over our heads and it misses us. This is why drops of the latter rain can be falling on hearts all around us and we completely don't know what is going on. We don't recognize the working of the Holy Spirit, beloved, because we think that we are strong. We think that we are rich and in need of nothing when we are wretched, when we are miserable, when we are poor, when we are blind, when we are naked, and we know it not. Beloved, we need Jesus right now. She says, when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind and the thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but who? Christ liveth in me. Beloved, can Christ in you answer the Sunday law? Absolutely. Can Christ in you answer the various oppressions and the various racisms that we are seeing in this world? Absolutely. 
Only Christ can do that. And so what we need in this generation is more of him and less of us. Nay, I say more of him and none of us. All of Jesus. Beloved, that is what we need. She says, this is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. What does this statement mean in light of the message of Jones and Wagner? What does this message mean for those third sets of servants in the third day, even today, for this generation? Beloved, we were told that the message of Jones and Wagner is our invitation to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the laws of God. This condition only comes to be when we receive that message, when we submit our hearts to that message, and we begin to study and to share that message. Beloved, we can't afford to not know this message. Can we understand this right now? Can we see this right now? We, 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 we're living in a generation where if there ever was a time to know what it is that we're talking about on the subject of justification by faith, that time is now. The time is now. The question is now, what of our generation? What of this generation, beloved? We're told in the book, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 93 and paragraph one. Satan's determined purpose is to eclipse the view of Jesus. Now, beloved, a solar eclipse does not last forever. In a solar eclipse, the moon blocks out the light of the sun, but the moon cannot change what the sun is. The sun remains what it is, though its light cannot touch humanity. The moon can only block the rays of light for so long. In the natural, it is the same in the spiritual. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. Beloved, Satan has sought to eclipse the view of Jesus. Now question, can that last forever? Absolutely not. We're told it has been Satan's determined purpose to eclipse the view of Jesus and lead men to look to man and to trust to man and to be educated to expect help from who? From man. For years, the church has been looking to man and expecting much from man, but not looking to Jesus in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered. Therefore, beloved, the word therefore implies a response. Because Satan's determined plan is to eclipse the view of Jesus, therefore, we're about to see God's response. Therefore, God gave to his servants a testimony that presented the truth as it is in Jesus, which is the third angel's message in clear, distinct lines. Beloved, God will answer in this generation and is answering in this generation Satan's plan to eclipse the view of Jesus with the third angel's message in clear, distinct lines, yea, even the fourth angel's message. Beloved, if Satan's plan is to eclipse the view of Jesus, then God's plan is to increase the views of Jesus. Can you see that? If Satan is seeking to block out the view of Christ, then God's true messengers in this final generation are seeking to remove everything that obscures the view of our great high priest. Everything that, that, that works as a smokescreen to block out the view of Jesus. Beloved, we have no time to be working in the, in the midst of smoke screens. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, beloved. Satan is afraid of a generation who are looking unto Jesus because he knows that by beholding him, we will become changed. The fact that we're living in the third day, the fact that we're living in the third calling, beloved, means that we need to have our eyes fixed upon our high priest because if we do that, then he will raise us up to live even as he lives in his sight. Beloved, this is a wonderful opportunity in which we find ourselves. But Jesus cannot answer the call for you. 
No other man can answer the call for you. No one can receive the righteousness of Christ for you. You have to make your calling and your election sure today. Today, if you hear his voice, beloved, harden not your heart as they did in the days of provocation. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 4, we are told, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. Does the Bible say thy light is coming? No, beloved. It says, for thy light is come. When William Miller, in the 1800s, gave the message of the first angel preaching the hour of his judgment is come, that was present truth. Today, beloved, God's servants are preaching, arise, shine, for thy light is come. This is a present reality for those who receive the word by faith. I am telling you, beloved, the light that Satan sought to keep away by eclipsing the view of Jesus is come to you today. The opportunity to understand the message is a click away in the links below. Beloved, we may have this light even now. The question is, will you have it to be so? Will you receive the call? What is the call? Very, very simple. Submit to the man, Christ Jesus. Receive the man, Christ Jesus. Beloved, meet the man, Christ Jesus. And in meeting him, in communion with him, in fellowship with him, in at one meant, with him, we will find ourselves living in the sight of a holy God, even without a mediator, ready to go home in this generation. Beloved, we will find in him that the eclipse is over. All right? No more blocking the view of Christ. You and I will become living epistles of who he is. The eclipse is over. That is what this generation is, beloved. That is what it means to be in the final generation. We are told, arise, shine, for thy light is come. Receive it today, beloved. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Beloved, in inspiration, we are told that little jets of light are going to finish this work. Here a little, and there a little, all over the world. Beloved, the world is covered in gross darkness, ignorance of God's character, ignorance of his righteousness, ignorance of law and order. But these little jets of light, beloved, we are invited to partake in that even now. We are invited to be a part of that procession, invited to be a part of those servants who give this loud cry to the entire world. Now, while inspiration does say that God does not now work to bring many in, we are invited to be among the few who receive it now so that at that time we can give it to the entire world. Beloved, what do you say? Do you want to be in that number who stand on the Mount Zion with the Lamb, the 144,000, having his character written in their foreheads? If so, then it is imperative that we understand this message for ourselves. It is imperative that we look upon the righteousness of Christ and improve upon it by the leading of the Holy Spirit, so much so that his life becomes our life. The eclipse is over. In the L.N.G. White 1888 Materials, page 765 in paragraph 6, we read our closing statement. It says, The end is near. We have not a moment to lose. Light is to shine forth from God's people in clear, distinct rays, bringing Jesus before the churches and before the world. As Christ's ambassadors, they are to search the scriptures to seek for the truths that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. And every ray of light received is to be communicated to others. She says, one interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other subject. Christ, our righteousness. Beloved, we have covered a lot today. We've spoken about a lot. And this is not something that's going to stick the first time around. I assure you, it is going to uh, require that you go back, that you study, that you read, that you review, that you play over and over again to understand what we have discussed here. We are not living in the 1800s. We're not in the first day of opportunity. 
We are not living in the 1950s. We are not in the second day of opportunity, beloved. We are in the year 2020, long beyond those days. We are living in the third day, the day of the third set of servants. We are tarrying in Jerusalem even now for the individuals who will receive the message, but we are moments, beloved, before phase two of the latter rain, before the power of the latter rain to give it to everyone under the sun after the passing of a Sunday law. Beloved, are the events around you not convincing you yet that we are moments to a Sunday law? I pray that we are not, uh, we have not had our senses dulled to the reality in which we are. I pray that we have not have our senses dulled to the reality of our situation. Beloved, we are this close to the finishing of Christ's work in the most holy place, this close to the return of Christ. That ought to make you happy. Sadly, I know that there are those of us who don't receive joy from those words because there are other enterprises that we would rather spend our time doing. There are other things that we want to have done. There are plans that we have. There, 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 there are families that we haven't yet formed. There, there, there are job opportunities and, and all kinds of things that we have placed before the Lord. Beloved, I tell you even now, nothing in this world that is worth having comes without sacrifice. Commune with the Lord. Reason with Him. And he will show you and make out of you a people that are able to say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Beloved, I want Jesus to come in my generation. I want Jesus to come in this generation. I believe that in this generation, that fourth angel is going to lighten the entire earth with his glory. And in order to be a part of that number, who finished the work, we're going to have to spend our time looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith.